Welcome to Emmanuel Church Glenhaven Bible Talks. Our church loves to engage with God's written word, the Bible, as we gather week by week. If you missed a sermon or want to hear it again, we pray that your time here today will refresh and renew you as you follow Jesus. Today we begin a new series of sermons on the first few chapters of Genesis called Good. Often we spend so much time with our faces down and nose to the grindstone that we forget our place in the grand scheme of things. We often only get a sense of our smallness and the enormity of the universe when we look up and around us. Perhaps it's the vastness of the ocean or of the Australian outback. Perhaps it's the heights of the mountains or the stars shining above them that brings home to us the glory of the Creator of all things. In this first talk, Hayden Smith takes us back to the beginning of the Bible, which tells us about the beginning of creation and the powerful, purposeful God who spoke it into being. He shows us the best way to respond to the wonder of creation. But before we hear from Hayden, let's listen to the Bible. The passage is Genesis chapter 1, verse 1 to 25. And verse 31. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. God saw that the light was good. And he separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning, the first day. And God said, Let there be a vault between the waters to separate water from water. So God made the vault and separated the water under the vault from the water above it. And it was so. God called the vault sky. And there was evening, and there was morning, the second day. And God said, Let the water under the sky be gathered to one place, and let dry ground appear. And it was so. God called the dry ground land, and the gathered waters he called seas. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, Let the land produce vegetation seed-bearing plants and trees on the land that bear fruit with seed in it, according to their various kinds. And it was so. The land produced vegetation, plants bearing seed according to their kinds and trees bearing fruit with seed in it, according to their kinds. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the third day. And God said, let there be lights in the vault of the sky to separate the day from the night and let them serve as signs to mark sacred times and days and years and let them be lights in the vault of the sky to give light on the earth. And it was so. God made two great lights, the greater light to govern the day and the lesser light to govern the night. He also made the stars. God set them in the vault of the sky to give light on the earth, to govern the day and the night, and to separate light from darkness. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the fourth day. And God said, Let the water teem with living creatures, and let birds fly above the earth across the vault of the sky. So God created the great creatures of the sea and every living thing with which the water teems and that moves about in it, according to their kinds, and every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. God blessed them and said, Be fruitful and increase in number, and fill the water in the seas, and let the birds increase on the earth. And there was evening, and there was morning, the fifth day. And God said, 
Let the land produce living creatures according to their kinds. The livestock, the creatures that move along the ground, and the wild animals, each according to its kind. And it was so. God made the wild animals according to their kinds, the livestock according to their kinds, and all the creatures that move along the ground according to their kinds. And God saw that it was good. God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And now, here's Hayden. Uh, Father, we thank you for this time together this morning. We pray by your Spirit and through the Holy Scriptures, which you have caused to be written, that you might help us to understand, to believe, and to put these things into practice. In Jesus' name, Amen. Now, it's not at all uncommon for people, particularly young people today, to take up a number of different careers in their lifetime. But I wonder, can you guess who the person is from their careers? So who is this? This person has worked as a doctor, surgeon, and presidential candidate. Any guesses? All right, let me... They've also... They've done a few other things. This might help. They've also been a downhill skier, an aerobics instructor, a vet, scuba diver dentist, Air Force pilot, astronaut, TV reporter, and more. Anyone? It is, of course, Barbie. (laughs) Now, I wonder which of those Barbies or Ken you most resonate with. Barbie was first released in 1959, and Barbies are still played with uh, on a weekly basis in our house today, not by me. And this fashion doll has, for decades, played an important role in reflecting the values of each generation, but not just reflecting the values of each generation, but actually shaping the values of that generation. And it will be no surprise to many of you that this year, Barbie, the movie, has been a a huge hit, generating more than $1.4 billion so far. It's been the runaway success of the big screen which is a, a wild, really, because it's an ambitious project. It's an over-the-top musical comedy that also is a deep philosophical exploration of what it means to be a human being. That seems like a lot to me. Um, the theme song um, performed by Billie Eilish is a hauntingly beautiful song, and she asks this important question. She sings, Now I'm not sure what I was made for. What was I made for? And who hasn't wrestled with that question? What am I supposed to be doing with my life? What is the goal of life? What am I made for? And it's fascinating to me that that question presupposes a sense of purpose. It's almost as though human beings are hardwired to think through the world in the sense of purpose. We we instinctively know that our existence is not without meaning. We are here for something, aren't we? The question is, for what? And that is why over the coming 10 weeks, as we study Genesis 1 through 11, we'll be considering these foundational questions. I mean, these are big questions, but they're also the most basic questions that you can ask. Fundamental questions about life. We'll be considering work and rest and sex and marriage and gender. What it means to be a physical and a spiritual person, as well as considering the place of sin and suffering in human experience and in families and generations. And through all of that, as you can see in the title for our series, there is something good about life, something good about the God who has brought the world into being and has blessed all that he has made. This is the teaching of Genesis 1. It was very good. Which brings us to that very first verse, the beginning from Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. As this was read for us before, it doesn't take long to realise that this passage sounds more like poetry than plain reading. Uh, That's because there's a certain repetition to it, isn't there? Genesis 1-3, and God said. Verse 6, and God said. Verse 9, and God said. And over and over and over again, nine times in this short chapter. But it's not just repetition of speaking. 
God made is repeated. God saw is repeated. God called is repeated, along with God's delight in that which is good, which is repeated. And at the close of each of the six days, these six mini chapters within this bigger chapter, we read, and there was evening and there was morning. Why does it sound like poetry? It sounds like poetry because it is. Or more specifically, it's a particular type of poetry called proto-history. It's a prologue, if you like. Now, some people, the engineers in the room, are thinking, poetry, are you saying this isn't real? No, that's not what I'm saying. Uh, While I was away on holiday, um, I read um, a theological book on definite atonement. I also read an inspirational guide to becoming a footballer written for primary age children. And I read a fantasy novel about a young woman who has to fight an army of the dead. (laughs) They were all good, but quite different styles of writing. And to understand them and to enjoy them, I needed to read them as literature to identify what is the purpose and style of this writing. And this is the case when we look at Genesis chapter 1. This poetry uses figurative or metaphorical language to communicate about real things. And we do this all the time, don't we? If I say, the police car flew past me on the highway, it denotes something real. That car was moving very fast, but it's not literally flying. The band came on stage and the crowd exploded. I hope they didn't, but it does teach us something real, doesn't it? The crowd gave off such energy and noise that it's almost as though there were an explosion. And this poetic history from Genesis 1 is teaching us something real and concrete through beautiful language. And as we look at this, the primary thing that this chapter wants to teach us is not so much how the world was made, but why. And this is a pretty common way of negotiating the world. I want you to imagine, if you will, that I received a beautifully wrapped gift. Not for any reason. It's not my birthday, not my anniversary, not Father's Day. This gift just arrives. And I open it, and inside was some of these. Now, for those listening along at home, we're looking at some spiky metal sticks. The first question that I'm going to ask is, what is it? (laughs) What does it do? What What is it for? At this point, first and foremost, I'm not interested in how it's made. I'm not interested in the mechanical and manufacturing processes that went into producing this thing. I want to know, what is it? Does anyone know what it is? These are... A great gift, they're temperature probes for meat. So you stick them into a steak or a roast so that you can know when it's perfectly cooked. A great gift for someone you love. By the way, it's only two and a half months till Christmas. Just, just, just saying. The question we ask first is not how is it made, but what is it for? That's true of any gift and certainly true of Genesis 1. The primary concern is not how the world was made, but what is it for? Having said that... The how still matters. We are curious. And so there's not time to spend a protracted um, period on questions today of evolution, the origins of life and the universe, of six-day creationism and more. But those questions are valid and important and so today we will touch on them briefly. But before I do, let me remind you of the important saying. In essentials, unity. In non-essentials, liberty in all things charity, which is a fancy way of saying as long as we as Christians agree on the gospel, the key bits of Christianity, it's okay to disagree about other bits. But whether you agree or disagree, it's always important to be kind and gentle, which is a fancy way of saying if you disagree with what I'm about to say, please don't kill me. I've read a very helpful book um, by John Lennox. He's the Emeritus Professor of Mathematics and Philosophy at Oxford University and a devout Bible-believing Christian. Um, It's called Seven Days That Divide the World, the beginning according to Genesis and science. I found it very helpful in sharpening my thinking on the how of creation, and I'll draw on some of his insights presently. Some reflections. Firstly, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. This first use of the heavens and the earth is Hebrew shorthand for the whole universe. God made everything from nothing. The fancy term for this is ex nihilo, 
or to borrow language from John 1, without him, nothing was made that has been made. God made everything, and he does so with a word. More on that next week. The second thing to say, and for those who believe in the God of the Bible, this goes without saying, God could have created the world in six literal days. Of course he could. To quote John Lennox, he says, of course the issue is not whether God could have done it in a particular way. Clearly as a basic principle, God being God can do it in any way he chooses. Thirdly, so how do we decide, is it the Bible or is it science? Well, why not both? But this is the key bit. We must get the Bible and scientific study in the right order. Again from John Lennox. He says, and this is the important point. Scripture, that is the Bible, has the primary authority. Experience of the world in general and science in particular has helped decide among the possible interpretations that Scripture allows. So sometimes there are multiple valid ways of interpreting the Bible. You read it, it could mean this, it could mean that. We're not entirely sure. Well, then how do you decide? Well, one of the factors is our ability to draw on our experience, our ability to draw on the study of the natural world to help us better understand the Bible. So fourthly, the question begs, for those who are sympathetic with evolution, as I am, is it possible to interpret the Bible as consistent with the world forming flora and fauna through long natural processes? Surely the text just says six days. That's not complicated, is it? Six days means six days. Well, it does depend on what you mean by day, or more specifically, what Genesis and the Bible mean by day. So in Genesis chapter 1, verse 5, Day, the word day there is contrasted with night, in which case day refers to 12 hours, which is different to Genesis 1.5, you'll note that's the same verse, which uses the word day in regard to morning and evening, presumably meaning a 24-hour period. Then there is the way the author speaks of day in Genesis chapter 2, verses 2 and 3, the Sabbath day, because that day is not bounded by morning and evening. It seems, and this is confirmed in the book of Hebrews, that this day of rest continues on indefinitely. And in Genesis chapter 2, verse 4, though the NIV translates it as, when the Lord God made, it actually says in the original Hebrew, in that day the Lord made the heavens and the earth. The use of the day there is more akin to back in the day or in my day. And so here we have four different uses of the word day in Genesis 1 and 2. And many of you would be familiar with 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 8, which says, With the Lord a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. Now that doesn't mean that for Christians who hold to the idea that God created the variety of life that we see in the world through the long process of evolution, that there aren't questions to be answered. Of course there are. It's hard to imagine peering into the origin of the universe and not having at least some questions and queries. And I'd be very happy to speak with you afterwards, to hear your questions, to hear your reflections, to dialogue with you. Fifthly, so I think it's possible to reconcile a divinely superintended process of stars forming and planets settling into orbits to bring together a God-ordained and overseen journey of evolution as the means by which God brought about the diversity and beauty that we see in the natural world. And I think it's entirely possible to reconcile this creative method with the Bible's description of God working in days. Although I note two things. For Christians, we don't believe that somehow God is less at work when he employs ordinary means than when he elects to work through miraculous means. God is always at work. Whether through the natural or the supernatural, God directs all things. So when we talk about processes like evolution, God gets all the glory. So am I saying that God works entirely through natural, ordinary means in the creation of the world? My view is perhaps not all of those processes. 
because if we return to Genesis chapter 1 and look at the text there, you know the pattern. And God said, and God said, and God said, once a day, and God said, except that on two occasions, God speaks twice on a day. Why is it that God chooses on two occasions to speak twice? I contend it's because that those moments were special. The first extra word spoken is when organic life enters the world. The second extra word is spoken when he makes human beings. It is my belief on the basis of Romans 5 and Genesis 1 that Adam and Eve are literal people, the forebears of Jesus. The second Adam lends me to conclude that on these two occasions when God brought organic life into being and when God brought human beings to life, that God created in a moment and surely he can do that. Just as we see in the resurrection, God can recreate life from death in a moment, so I believe in those key moments in the development of the world, God created life in a moment. And so through natural and supernatural processes, God made the world, perhaps over a long period of time, or maybe he just did it in six days, I don't know. But the important thing whether you agree with me or disagree with me, as John Lennox concludes, he says this, the most important thing by far is that God did it. And that is something I'm sure that we can all agree on. But back to the main question, why? Why did God make the world? As many of you know, I want a church cow. Um, if you've got any good cow names, come and speak to me later. The problem is that I have no idea how to care for a cow. I don't even know what a cow house looks like, let alone how to make a cow house. God, in calling the world into being, is building a house, a home for his creations. As God creates a home for each of his creations, he does so in a way that is thoughtful wise and good, perfectly suited to its occupant. So on day one, God creates night and day, thus providing a home of sorts for, which he then on day four, creates sun, moon and stars. On day two, God creates the sky and seas to gift as a home for, day five, the birds and fish and sea creatures. And finally, day three, God makes the land and vegetation, presenting a home for mammals and reptiles and through all of this God collectively provides a home for the most precious of God's creatures, you, for us, for human beings. This is the why, you are the why. God made this world as a home for you. More on that next week. So what is our application? Three things. Firstly, wonder. Did you see there in verse 31? God saw all that he had made and it was very good. This is God delighting in his creation and we are to do the same. We are to take pleasure in, to enjoy, to find happiness in God's world. On holiday recently, I had the joy of riding my bicycle before the world woke up, which means I saw a variety of sunrises and within, uh, not so far from where we were staying there, on the border between New South Wales and Queensland, I had the privilege of seeing the sunrise through the green foliage of the rainforest and can confirm it is beautiful, but different to the way the sunrise looks from the top of a mountain, which is different again to the way the sunrise looks whilst riding along the coast. Each of those is different, but each to be delighted in. What do you wonder in? What do you delight in? What do you take pleasure in in God's world? Holding a newborn? Skiing in the not-so-snowy mountains? Patting a new dog at the park? The first jacaranda of summer? A comfortable bed with fresh linen? The smell of coffee? The stars in the sky viewed from the Kimberley? Seeing a whale breach through the waves? listening to live music, a hug from a friend, the first chill of the southerly buster as it breaks on a sweltering day, the sound of a kookaburra, appreciating a Dutch painting, feeling your muscles burn as you push your body to do more, 
a beautifully appointed room, a moonrise, the last Tim Tam. What was the name of the series again? Good. How can you foster a sense of wonder, a sense of joy and gladness in the good world that God has made? In all of its immensity, in all of its intricacy. But it's not just wonder. It's not less than that, but we are called to more than that. I mentioned my hypothetical gift before, and I mentioned that the what, that is, why does this exist, what's it for, that matters more than the how's it made. And that's true, kind of, but it's not the most important question. The most important question is not what is it for, but who gave the gift. Imagine um, on my gift that I received, well, I've not received it yet, two and a half months till Christmas, but... um, When that gift arrives, imagine there's a card on it. And I go to the card and I open it and it says, from your secret admirer. Step one, tell Libby. Um, But that's infuriating, isn't it? Because you want to know, who is the person who thought of you? What's their motivation? Why have they chosen to give this to you? Well, here in Genesis, there is no secret admirer. The who has made themselves clear. 30 times we see God doing something in and for his creation in Genesis 1. And so we have to respond to this who. Uh, Paul Kingsnorth, who was converted to Christianity only a few years ago, writes, And yet, he says, as the years went on, Zen Buddhism was not enough. It was full of compassion, but it lacked love. It lacked something else too, and it took me a long time to admit to myself what it was. I wanted to worship. My teenage atheist self would have been horrified. (laughs) Something was happening to me, slowly, steadily, that I didn't understand, but I could clearly sense. I felt like I was being filed gently into a new shape. This is his journey over the past two years of recognising the call on his life a common human call to change wonder into worship. Creation teaches us, invites us to join with creation in gathering up that sense of wonder, that delight, that joy that we have and offering it in worship to the Creator. As Romans chapter 1 teaches us, just as God spoke in creation at the beginning, so God is speaking in creation today to you calling us to glorify God and give thanks to Him. In the words of the modern hymn, so will I. If the stars were made to worship, so will I. If the mountains bow in reverence, so will I. If the oceans roar your greatness, so will I. For if everything exists to lift you high, so will I. Wonder leads to worship. But there is one more hidden application here in Genesis 1. For God was making a home for humanity, but more specifically, He planned not just to make a home for humanity, God has always planned to make His home with humanity. For from before the creation of the world, God planned to walk with His people. We see a glimpse of it in Genesis 3, where God walks in the garden, but what is hinted at in the Old Testament is made plain in the New. In John's Gospel, where Jesus, the very word, the very one who created and sustains the world, and I quote from John 1.14, the New International Reader's Version, he made his home with us. We are made to walk with the Son by the Holy Spirit day by day. I am sure that it's not just Barbie who is asking, what was I made for? We all are. But the answer, according to our Creator, is that we are made to wonder at God's creation, to worship the Creator, and to walk with His Son. This is why you are fearfully and wonderfully made. Amen. Thanks for listening. We trust today's message encouraged you as you follow Jesus. For more information about Emmanuel Church, please visit our website, glenhaven.church. Until next time, bye for now.